So the last topic we're going to cover in ARC 348 uh, is high-rise design strategies. So how we take some of the things we've learned about gravity loads and wind loads and combine them when we're facing sort of extreme situations, right? Scales, uh, heights that are uh, taller than the sort of five, 10 stories that most architectural projects involve. This is a particular kind of set of problems that um, make a, a particular structural type, right? The high rise frame, we're looking not only at gravity and lateral loads as we would with any frame, but we're looking at them taken to kind of extreme lengths. And we have certain ways of dealing with these uh, that essentially try to wrap efficient structures around efficient programs. And we come up with a few ways of dealing with the kind of exponential difficulties that we get uh, when we build tall. Fundamental problems are twofold. Uh, we have uh, gravity loads that we're multiplying many, many times. And as we do that, um, we are, of course, increasing the size of our structural members. So columns get larger because they're carrying more floors and therefore they are carrying more weight. Um, that's not a problem if we're in the sort of one to 10 story range, but as we get up to 25, 30 stories, what we find is that we're not only carrying the additional weight of the floors, but we're carrying the additional weight of the larger structure that it takes to carry those floors. So one way to think about this is if we're going from 30 to 31 stories, it's not like we're adding a story at the top, which is easy because that's just one story. We're adding a story at the bottom, basically. And what that means is that we need to add columns that are carrying the weight of the entire building. So the issue is that if we build really, really tall and we're not careful and we let our uh, loads get kind of out of hand, um, we end up with a first floor or a first few floors that are mostly structure where the columns and the shear walls and things get to be so big that we don't have any space for the program that we want to put in there. And if you think about a typical skyscraper, typical office building, um, that first floor is usually exactly where we want the big, tall lobby spaces that mean long, unbraced columns, and also where we want big, grand entrances, which means pushing the columns further and further apart. So the, the functional program of a skyscraper and the structural program right away start to clash, and we start to find difficulties in getting the large columns and shear walls that we need to hold the gravity loads up to coincide with what we want out of the spaces that form the, the lower levels of a skyscraper. This is compounded by the fact that as we build taller and taller, our lateral problems get greater and greater also, and they too get greater exponentially instead of linearly. So the problem, as we saw in our lateral lectures, is that we're basically building these skyscraper frames as cantilevers against the lateral forces of wind. As we go taller, we are increasing the area that the wind has to push on our skyscraper frame, but we are also increasing the moment arm, right? The twist that that wind uh, puts onto the frame relative to, to its base. So we're adding two sets of problems every time we go taller when we're thinking about uh, lateral resistance. The other issue is that we end up with buildings uh, as we go taller and taller that tend to be much skinnier, much more slender. This means that uh, we have problems with uh, vibration, oscillation. We're building buildings that are essentially giant tuning forks and we have to worry not only about their strength, but also their stiffness and how we put resistance to deflection and particularly resistance to that harmonic deflection that both makes us air sick uh, and also uh, puts dynamic stress onto building structures that maybe we hadn't anticipated. One way to deal with this is to think about materials that work well at different scales. If we're talking about kind of low to, uh, buildings that have a, a slenderness ratio or a, a height to footprint ratio, uh, of just sort of two to one, three to one, four to one, we're in a kind of very normal uh, scale and it's relatively easy to make sure that those buildings are both strong and stiff enough to resist gravity uh, and lateral forces. As we get taller, we start to get limited in the materials that we have. Historically, when we've gotten above five to one, we switch from maybe timber uh, construction to steel construction. 
we'll leave masonry construction out of it because masonry is, is weaker than concrete and therefore the size of piers or the size of walls get much too big uh, by the time we get up to 8, 10, 12 stories. We haven't really built masonry skyscrapers for, for more than 100 years. But steel helps us because it's stronger than timber uh, and it's also stiffer. Uh, and therefore, historically, when we've gotten up to these sort of first, this first level of slenderness ratio, five to one to seven to one, we've had to switch to steel from something like timber. We would often do that anyway. If we're building with light timber, we're usually limited to about four stories for fire reasons. New heavy uh, mass timber construction is starting to challenge this. And we are seeing buildings uh, that are getting taller and taller, 16, 17 stories uh, out of CLT. Um, but we still have this issue with stiffness and making connections uh, in timber that are stiff enough to prevent some of this motion when we get to slenderness ratios of 5 to 1 to 7 to 1. Very often we'll incorporate steel into the timber structure uh, to help stiffen it, or we'll link that timber structure with a stiff core made out of steel uh, or concrete. When we get uh, higher than uh, 7 or 8 to 1, um, then we're faced with a stiffness problem. And steel, remember, even though it's a stiffer material than timber, is still relatively ductile. And what we find when we get to super skinny buildings is that we really need the stiffness and we also need the mass of concrete to prevent these harmonic vibrations, these wind-based uh, oscillations. So by the time we get up to something like 10 to 1, we're going to be basically limited uh, in our structural palette to concrete and, and probably not much else. If we get taller than that, uh, like 432 Park Avenue, this uh, residential skyscraper by Rafael Vignoli, uh, done a few years ago in New York, then we find that we need really extreme measures. We need to do something to the frame that helps to either stiffen it or that uses inertia to actually deaden the, the vibrations, the wind-based vibrations that we get. In the case of 432 Park Avenue, Vignoli's engineers uh, suggested actually making the columns thicker at the top of the building, putting more concrete uh, at the very, very top of the building as a damper, right? as a, as a passive damper that would help uh, prevent the oscillations. You can think about this. If you took a yardstick and you uh, shake it back and forth, the top will move around quite a bit. If you stuff like an apple or an orange or something on top of that yardstick and try to do it, you'll see that it takes more energy to oscillate that, uh, that, that weight uh, at that distance. So putting more weight at the top of the structure, counterintuitive, but this is a way to dampen those vibrations, uh, or using something like a tuned mass damper, uh, a weight that is attached to the structural frame by springs or by pistons, uh, and that basically stays in the same uh, place physically while the building moves around it. And that can be used to dampen uh, those oscillations as well. When we're thinking about combining uh, gravity resistance and lateral resistance and also trying to stiffen the building, um, we'll very often in high rises look to combine the structure or to wrap the structure around uh, vertical chases or vertical shafts that already need fire protection or already need kind of separation. So we'll basically, we're, if we're building this tall, we're usually uh, building uh, the structure out of uh, concrete or we're building the structure out of steel with a concrete core. And that concrete serves basically two purposes or three purposes really. Uh, it provides fire protection for things like fire stairs, elevator shafts, uh, mechanical chases. Uh, it certainly carries some of the gravity load uh, if those uh, shear walls go all the way down to the foundation. And likewise, assuming that we can connect those shear walls to the foundation, those core walls, those concrete shear walls, will also form uh, most of a skyscraper's lateral resistance as well. So here you see uh, a typical skyscraper frame. The columns uh, could be out of steel or concrete, but you can see that the, the, the engineer has put uh, long shear walls in both directions, right, north, south, east, west, uh, to take up any uh, lateral forces from wind that's blowing anywhere around the compass. And if you kind of squint at it, you'll see that what the engineer has done here is basically designed a giant cantilevered W shape. So you can think of these shear walls here 
as forming the flanges of a giant beam. And again, a beam sticking up out of the earth instead of spanning from uh, support to support. And these shear wall here, shear walls here that wrap around uh, the building core, these form a kind of web. And even though they're not connected, they'll be attached by stiff uh, floor plates that have that, that diaphragm action that can, uh, that can uh, distribute stresses to various portions of the frame. And those shear walls will basically function as a giant concrete W shape or I beam turned on its end and supported only at the, at the base. So a very, very tall, um, very, very heavy cantilevered beam designed both to take the compressive gravity loads of the building structure, all the occupants, all the live loads, but also designed as an I-beam to work as a cantilever. And it'll work in two directions. We know that I-beams typically have a, a weak axis and a strong axis. That's the same case here. Um, but that, uh, even the weak axis will be designed to have enough resistance uh, to wind loads that, that, that it'll be effective. Now, these uh, shear walls here, the, the ones that form the web in this scenario, that might interfere with the building function. If we want perfectly open floor plates, which skyscraper clients typically do, those shear walls might not be acceptable. We may need to compress all of the gravity and lateral functions into the, into the core itself. And we'll have this back and forth between the, the, the kind of desire for open floor plates uh, on the part of the client and this desire for efficient shapes in, uh, that will resist lateral forces on the part of the engineer. What the engineer would like is a perfect column shape. So they would really like a hollow tube, shear walls that form a, a kind of hollow tube, thinking of the building uh, not only as a giant column, but also as a perfectly efficient beam in any direction. Remember when we were talking about column theory, we talked about how a hollow tube was perfect, uh, a perfect shape against buckling, because it would have equal resistance to buckling in any direction. And that's exactly what a structural engineer wants in a, in a skyscraper core design. Now, if they really have their way, they would make that hollow tube basically envelop the whole skyscraper, right? They would push all of the shear resistance, all of the lateral resistance out to the outside. A bigger hollow tube is going to be more effective against buckling, or in this case, more effective against wind-related bending uh, than a narrow one. Our client clearly is not going to want a 30 or 40 story tower that it has shear walls all around the outside, right? They want windows, they want their uh, tenants to be able to see out. So there may be compromises if, if the structural engineer uh, insists on having a, a kind of hollow tube as a building, um, there may be compromises that have to do with where windows go or how we organize core elements like elevators and staircases so that they're in efficient places on the perimeter of a, of a skyscraper. We'll see some examples of this uh, in a little bit. More commonly, we'll design the center core of an office building uh, so that it has adequate lateral resistance in both directions. And very often, the engineer will end up uh, using probably oversized walls or ex extra reinforcing to basically compress all of the lateral resistance into that core, eliminate shear walls both on the exterior of the building where our clients will want windows, and if they can, on the inside of the building where we would like clear floor plates. So we'll end up with these very, very efficient, very tightly planned cores where just about every square inch that's not an elevator or a restroom or a fire stair uh, is going to be concrete of some sort, right? Some sort of concrete uh, shear wall. The other thing that, our, uh, that the engineers will want is a good structural shape against lateral forces. And they will, uh, if, if they have their way, they would prefer a shape that is wider at the base and smaller at the top. And you remember from our lecture on lateral forces, this does two things. One is it spreads out the kind of footprint of the building so that we have a, a greater resisting moment at the base. Uh, a, a longer moment arm and therefore greater leverage uh, that the foundations can, can use to push back uh, against the overturning moment uh, of, of a strong wind. 
The other thing is that as that form tapers, um, it means that there is less area for the wind to push against as you go taller and taller in the building. And therefore, the longer the cantilever arm that the wind has to push on the building, the narrower the building and thus the less area the wind has to push. So we're gaining efficiency in a couple of ways by having a skyscraper form that's wider at the base uh, and tapered at the top. And of course, um, we'll want to have those, the connections to the foundations be very stiff, right? To be fixed basically at the base so that we have a good working cantilever against, uh, against any wind loads. When we're designing cantilevers, remember, um, we have uh, a, a, a kind of very simple moment diagram, right? Moment is greatest at the root, uh, least at the, at the tip. When we're designing high-rise buildings, though, if we think about them as cantilevers kind of stuck out from the side of the ground against the wind, um, remember from wind gradients that as we go taller and taller and taller, the wind speed and therefore the wind load actually increase as we get further from the, from the ground. So when we get really tall, up over a thousand feet, um, and, and experience these wind gradients, the pressure to make a kind of tapered building form or an aerodynamically efficient form gets greater and greater. And very often we'll get to be determinate, right? We'll have to find ways to decrease the uh, area, the, the elevation of the build, elevational area of the building uh, as we get toward the top. And all of the usual cantilever problems apply. We, we talked about this a little bit, especially when we were talking about seismic forces. The building structure will go into bending, uh, bending again from a vertical plane instead of a, a horizontal. Um, if we have any kind of uh, differential in the building stiffness, we might get a torsion. And all of the connections, all of the floors of the building will experience varying levels of shear, right? It'll get greater and greater uh, as we get down to the ground. We use a handful of strategies, a handful of kind of cantilever strategies um, to resist this. So one of them is the shape. A taper, remember, is the, uh, the ideal shape for wind, but it's also the best shape for a cantilever, right? It, it mimics the moment diagram of a cantilever, puts the greatest depth, or in our case now the greatest width, where the moment forces are our strongest, right, which is at the, at the base. We can turn our building into a truss. A truss, remember, is a lightweight way of carrying uh, forces over a distance. So we can make a cantilever truss out of our building, stick it up out of the ground and, and rely on that triangulation to carry the lateral forces, the wind loads. Um, we can also do things like bundling elements together so that we give them added stiffness, uh, pushing against each other and relying on individual resistance to deflection kind of multiplied or, or, or combined. And then finally, we can hybrid these up. We can add these together. We can get some synergies by using these techniques uh, in concert with one another to get the advantages of one system, the advantages of another system. And sometimes those combine together to create more hyperstatic structures, structures with more load paths for the wind, uh, wind loads to follow, uh, and therefore structures that can be more effective, more efficient. Sometimes you see this play out very literally. Uh, the Transamerica Pyramid in San Francisco uh, is a kind of landmark building, but it is also as good a wind design or as good a, a kind of a lateral forces skyscraper design as you can get. Um, you can see that it uh, expands outward toward the base. Uh, the, this giant truss around the base solves this problem of having a bigger and bigger structure, but wanting more and more open space and more and more open uh, passages for entrances. As the building tapers, it's not only reducing the wind load on the building, but in San Francisco, it's also reducing the amount of uh, weight that's put at the top. So uh, reducing the kind of seismic impact that the inertia of a heavy building has when most of its weight is, is up at the top. You can see that the Transamerica building has an interesting functional problem though, right? Which is that the ideal wind shape or the ideal lateral shape as it gets to the top of the building um, interferes with the ideal circulatory patterns of the, of the structure. And the two little ears that stick out of the sides of the Transamerica building uh, are not an intended architectural effect. That is the building core. The building core 
Uh, it gets smaller as it goes up, but not, not at a, a kind of fast enough rate, right? The building is getting smaller, faster than they can drop off the number of elevators and fire stairs, things like that. So at that very, very top floor, you've basically got a full building core, a pair of fire stairs, uh, four elevators probably at that point, men's room, women's room, mechanical uh, ductwork, all of this stuff. And then just this very, very, very narrow band of actual functional space sticking out of it. So even though Transamerica is a, a kind of well-known, much loved, uh, much respected building, there's this very, very interesting problem at the top where the structural engineering and the kind of core design uh, clash in a way that once you see it, uh, is very, very obvious, right? A, a, a real apparent problem in integrating the structure and the services of a, of a tall building. We have a number of systems that kind of prove themselves at, at various heights. And just like the, the um, we have a palette of materials, some of which work better at various slenderness ratios than others, um, we have a number of techniques where uh, we gain efficiency as we move taller and taller by switching the way that our structure uh, works. So left to right, just very quickly, um, if we're below 200 feet, we typically get enough stiffness in the partitions and the connections of a typical building, especially if it's in concrete, um, that we're not really so worried about specif specific uh, wind resistant or lateral resistant structures. So we have what's called a non-rigid frame. That doesn't mean it's completely loose. We obviously need to accommodate uh, small lateral loads, but we don't really need to do anything that dramatic or that exceptional to keep the building uh, up and to keep it from falling over. When we go from 200 to 400 feet, we'll very often just look at the connections between girders and columns, make them extra stiff, maybe uh, increase the size of the girders a little bit, increase the size of the columns a little bit so that we can get good bolted or welded connections in steel, or so we can get plenty of rebar and concrete that will take up the, the shear and the bending uh, stresses that we'll get in them. Above 400 feet, um, we'll usually have some kind of bracing. This bracing can happen either on the exterior of the building or more commonly in the core of the building. Um, this bracing takes the function of uh, lateral resistance away from the girders and columns, and therefore those can be uh, much smaller. As we go up uh, higher than that, uh, from 600 to 800 feet, we'll have a brace frame with what are called outrigger trusses. So ways of connecting the exterior structure, where, which is going to be doing the most kind of uh, work, the most kind of uh, anti-buckling or anti-bending work, connecting those to the core. And we'll look at this in detail uh, here in a little bit. Again, we can use uh, small columns and girders, but we'll have trusses uh, every 15 or 20 stories that basically connect the core to the exterior structure very rigidly and essentially keep the building, uh, keep that next 15 or 20 stories perpendicular to the, the truss itself, a way of limiting uh, the drift or limiting the bending uh, of the building structure. Above 900 feet, we have to do some pretty uh, extraordinary things. So either we need to design what's called a structural tube, basically treating the building exterior uh, as a giant column, finding ways, of course, to get windows in, but also thinking about the, the structure basically uh, on the outside of the building doing most of the work. Uh, taller than that, we'll use what's called a bundled tube. So we'll design a handful of these hollow tubes and then we'll use them to brace one another against buckling. Above this, we get into some really exotic stuff. So diagrids where we're relying on cross bracing, but we're combining that with the tube principle. So we're putting those uh, cantilever trusses on the exterior of the building where they will have the most resisting moment uh, against wind forces. And then finally, the super talls that we build today we almost go like all the way around through the looking glass and we're back to the idea of putting uh, all of the lateral resistance in the cores. The cores to these buildings though, these super talls, look much, much different than the kind of um, rectilinear cores that we see uh, in, in, in smaller buildings, uh, in smaller uh, high rises today. And we'll look at examples of some of these here in a minute. 
So the first thing to, uh, to talk about is just what the difference between a, a non-rigid and a rigid frame. And, and if you go back and think about what we were talking about uh, in lateral forces, um, we can either design connections between girders and columns so that they are pinned or so that they are fixed. Uh, pinned connections are easier, they're lighter, fixed connections are heavier, but you can see that there's a big advantage to them. If we have a, a, a kind of non-rigid frame uh, and we're building it five or six or ten stories and we build it with pin connections, we're relying only on the stiffness of the columns to keep the building from drifting or to keep the building from deflecting. If we stiffen the connections, then you can see in the diagram on the right, we're maintaining that 90 degree angle between the girder and the column in every case. And when we get a, a wind force, in this case, pushing left to right, you can see that we're recruiting not only the columns themselves, but also the girders. And to move the building, the wind has actually got to twist every single structural member in the frame. So stiffening those connections comes with a, a cost. We often need to use expensive welding or extra bolting uh, or have some reinforcement in, in each one of those connections. We also typically uh, use more material, more concrete or more steel. Um, but as you can see, we get a, a very, very solid frame, a very rigid frame that resists not only gravity loads, but also wind loads by itself. So there's no need to, to build a stiff core uh, with, these, with these rigid frames up to a certain height. What do rigid frames look like? Well, you can certainly see on the left that the engineer uh, and architect have, have decided to express this structural principle. So you can think of this structure as a bunch of uh, tabletops, right, that are stacked on top of one another. If you think about a typical dining table, the leg usually has some kind of connection to the top that involves a, a, a sort of stiff corner or a couple of stiff corners. And here you can see that the, the columns uh, and the girders have these very, very big, very, very rigid connections between them. This is a little bit exaggerated. This is, isn't that tall a building and, and whether that much stiffness is really needed or whether there's some uh, excess architecture going on here is, is a little bit hard to say. We looked at 86880 Lakeshore Drive, these framed uh, steel buildings by uh, Mies van der Rohe. These operate on the same principle, and you can see that the effect isn't really that great, that all Mies uh, has done here, or really all Frank Kornacker, his structural engineer, has done, is oversize all of the girders, all of the columns by just a little bit, and then rely on the continuity of those hundreds of connections uh, to collectively resist any wind uh, that, that hits the structure. So every one of those stiff connections will maintain the 90 degree angle between girder and column, and therefore for uh, any wind to deflect one of those towers, it has to literally deflect or deform every single element in the structure, all, all the girders, all of the columns. They're all being, as engineers say, recruited into resisting uh, lateral forces. The outrigger principle uh, is a little bit similar. So it relies on uh, stiff connections in the frame. But again, every 15 or 20 stories, uh, one of these structures will have a, a, usually a story tall or two story tall outrigger truss. And this will do two things. One is it's a way of creating a very stiff connection between girders and columns, right? There's nothing that's gonna uh, alter the geometry of, of that truss. This basically uh, restrains the building, keeps what we call its drift very low. If we have several of these, it sort of resets the building structure uh, at, at each one of the trusses. But most effective are when these trusses connect a rigid core with a rigid structure on the outside. Um, an early one of these, there's a concrete uh, structure by uh, Nervi in Montreal. And you can see that there is a, a truss that has these two diagonal walls, this letter X. Um, those are going to stiffen the building structure against wind in any compass direction. And then again, every sort of 12, 14 stories, there is one of these outrigger trusses that connects to giant piers on the exterior of the building. And what that does is it basically takes any bending force that the building is experiencing and puts them or shares them between that core uh, 
uh, and the, what are called the outrigger columns or the outrigger piers. The sort of common way that structural engineers use to describe this is someone using ski poles, right? A way to balance yourself uh, as you're skiing. Here, a way to take the, the wind forces that a building is undergoing and to put them out as far as you can, right? To give them the greatest possible resisting moment uh, that you can. In the middle here, uh, First Wisconsin Center in Milwaukee, probably the best example of this uh, by Skidmore Owings and Merrill. You can see there are belt trusses or outrigger trusses uh, three or four stories up uh, and then 10 or 15 stories up and then at the very top of the building. And these are each uh, uh, stiffening the building frame, preventing the drift, kind of resetting the building structure as the wind tries to move it, but also transferring all of those loads uh, or sharing all of those loads between the core uh, and those outrigger columns uh, on the exterior, making the, the, the uh, outside columns do most of the work, right? Because those are most efficiently placed uh, to resist the wind. We can take that principle further and just put all of the building structure on the exterior uh, in what are called tube structures. And Fosler Khan, a great uh, structural engineer for SOM, usually credited with developing these as a, as a way to make uh, very, very stiff skyscraper frames that also have very, very open floor plates uh, and relatively lightly structured cores. So here a building in Chicago, the Brunswick building, um, you can see in the plan, it's basically a giant hollow tube, right? Just like a, 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 a column, or just like if you think about it like a paper towel roll, right? If you take a paper towel roll slice it down the middle and, and wind it up, what you've got is a typical building core, right? Where all of the resistance is right in the middle, you can bend that fairly easily. If you take a fresh paper towel roll, it's very, very hard to bend, very, very hard to buckle because all of the structure is on the outside. So the Brunswick building is basically giant paper towel roll, but made out of concrete, of course, and on a rectilinear uh, geometry. Um, if you look close, you can see that uh, around the perimeter, uh, Khan has designed a, a bunch of relatively large concrete columns spaced very closely together. Um, you can think of this either as hundreds of columns spaced closely together, dozens of columns spaced closely together, or you can think about it as a rigid set of four shear walls uh, that just have a lot of penetrations in them. Either way, Khan is relying on a very, very stiff building exterior to concentrate not only the gravity resistance, but also the lateral resistance on the exterior skin uh, of the building. Um, here you can see the, that um, the concrete coming down. Khan has the problem, of course, that we want big lobbies, we want big entrances. And so he designed a, a story high transfer girder that collects all of the loads from these various uh, small columns on the exterior and spreads them out to the four uh, large piers that go across the front of the building. Architecturally, maybe not quite so successful, um, but a, a, a kind of a very, very straightforward way of dealing with the, this, this conflict between the way the structure wants to work, bringing all these loads straight down to the ground and the way that the function of the skyscraper wants to work, right? Having a big grand entrance uh, at, the, at, the, um, at, the, at the base. One really interesting uh, thing about this building, two really, really interesting things. The core is still made out of concrete and Khan relied on uh, the concrete that's in the core, mostly for fireproofing, to add stiffness to the building frame, to the tube structure. So he intentionally designed the floor plates as very, very rigid diaphragms that connect the core and the exterior shear walls uh, so that they both move in concert, right? There's no uh, flexibility really in the shear wall. If any of the shear wall moves, it, it uh, pushes the core as well. And therefore the two of them are tied together. They work together. The other really interesting thing is that because the structure is on the outside and because Chicago gets very cold, um, they realized that they would have a problem in winter when that inside core at 72 degrees, right, inside room temperature, was much, much warmer than the exposed outside structure, which might be at 5, 10 below uh, zero Fahrenheit. 
Um, that in a tall building creates significant difference in thermal expansion. The core is basically going to be taller than the exterior wall. And so all of these rigid diaphragm floors, at the top anyway, had to be connected with hinges at the exterior wall and at the core to allow for this differential movement, something like three quarters of an inch uh, on a cold day that the core would be taller than the exterior wall. Doesn't sound like a lot, but in a stiff, brittle material like concrete, it would be enough to cause some serious cracking. So you can see the details here that Khan and his team developed so that these stiff diaphragm floors would nevertheless allow differential movement between the exterior structure uh, and the interior core. Khan, of course, went on to develop tube structures that uh, were bundled together to create additional uh, kind of mega structures that relied not only on the stiffness of the individual tubes, but in the way that those tubes could actually uh, uh, buttress one another at, at, uh, along their heights. You can think about this like taking a bunch of drinking straws, right? Easy to buckle at one single drinking, drinking straw. If you tie them together, if you glue them together, then they brace one another. Uh, and you can't buckle nine drinking straws uh, tied together as easily as you could nine individual uh, straws. So the scheme for the Sears Tower, which at the time is the tallest building in the world, um, was to take nine steel tubes, uh, all made out of moment frames. You see here on the right, this is a detail of uh, the, the steel structures, so deep girders, uh, wide columns, torque boxes welded into them to continue the flanges of the girders through the web of the columns and therefore to create literally hundreds and hundreds of these very, very stiff connections throughout each tube. Those tubes are then tied together with uh, trusses, belt trusses, uh, at uh, three points uh, throughout the, the building structure. Those, again, they, they tie the tubes together, they make the tubes brace one another, uh, but they also have this effect of kind of resetting the building, right? Limiting drift uh, in this very tall tower. And you can see that for programmatic reasons, these tubes drop off as you go up. Sears, which wanted giant 50,000 square foot floor plates, took the lower part of the building and they rented out the smaller floor plates with more perimeter, uh, greater access to daylight, uh, to tenants who paid more and more the, the higher they went up uh, in the building. Now, that also has the effect of tapering the building form. So there is less surface area at the top of the building for the wind to push on, and therefore uh, less force being added as the building gets more and more vulnerable uh, as a cantilever. So here's an example where the function of the building, uh, wanting smaller and smaller floor plates as you go up, aligns very nicely with the structural, uh, the ideal structural performance of the building. Having less area exposed to wind, having a wider footprint at the base than, 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 the, than you do at the top. And here you see, so this is one of Sears uh, floor plates. Um, here you have tenant floor plates and you can imagine renting out not only making money not only off of the, the amount of area but the access to the, the views, right? Tallest building in the city, so by the time you get up to the very top, um, these offices have, uh, are, have very, very small floor plates, um, but almost everyone can see out. And Sears employees um, maybe uh, can, maybe can't. Here you get a good sense for the tapering form. And also you can see the location of those belt trusses is aligned with mechanical floors that will serve up and down uh, the building as well. Here a, a detail, uh, these uh, what were called Christmas trees, two-story sections of these very, very heavy steel uh, girder and column uh, hybrids, welded up in the shop, of course, brought to the site. They made these as large as they could get through the streets of Chicago, uh, and then uh, raised each one individually, bolted them together at their midpoints. So notice that the, the, the stiff connections are where the columns and the girders align. Um, the uh, weaker connections are actually at the midpoint of the girder, right? which seems kind of counterintuitive when we think about beam design. You can think about each of these, though, as little cantilevers being stuck out uh, from the torque box. And then it makes a little bit more sense uh, 
to think about the joint actually being in the middle uh, instead of at the, at the end. Here, construction shot, you can see by the time that uh, the, you get down to the base, this steel, these webs and flanges are two and three inches thick. So a lot of uh, gravity load being taken up, of course, in a 110 story building. Um, but even more importantly, when you get to that height, uh, the lateral forces and the moment that's being taken by each one of these connections uh, is pretty considerable. And here you get a sense for the scale. We'll talk about this guy uh, here in, in just a little bit. We can take that tube structure and we can put, uh, we can combine that with the uh, cross bracing idea to get what we call a diagrid. So a structure that takes not only the gravity loads, but also the lateral loads and is put on the exterior of the structure to take advantage uh, of the tube principle. Uh, Swiss Re, uh, or the so-called Gherkin, skyscraper by Foster's uh, in London, uh, does this really well. It's an aerodynamic shape. Not only does it taper toward the top, uh, but it's also round, so it avoids a lot of the problems with uh, vortices that square or rectangular buildings deal with. Uh, the structure that you see on the outside, the spiral uh, patterns, uh, those steel elements are supporting the floors, holding them up against gravity. They all have vertical components, um, but because they wrap all the way around the building, that diagrid is also capable of resisting wind load from any direction. So you've just taken what in a, a, a more typical building might be a separate gravity system made up of columns and a lateral system made up of shear walls, and you just combine those um, because of the geometry, because each one of these raking members can take vertical and horizontal loads, um, the diagrid basically eliminates the need for two separate systems. Here, another uh, building by Foster's, the Hearst Tower in New York, does the same thing, but now on a, a, a square base. Um, each one of those triangles taking the loads of the floors, but also working like a truss to resist wind from any direction. And not quite as aerodynamic a shape, um, but you can see the cut corners and things allow wind to kind of roll around the building uh, and not form these vortices that might otherwise oscillate it, right, or make it. Uh, start to vibrate back and forth. The principle here is important. We're taking the gravity loads, we're transferring them into a truss because it's a network, because all of these cords and nodes uh, are connected to one another. Uh, any kind of um, uh, higher loading in one place ends up being spread throughout the entire structure. So it's very efficient, not only at carrying gravity loads and lateral loads, but also distributing both of those, right? Making sure that every single member in the, in the structure is helping to carry uh, either gravity or lateral loads or both. And these can be, diagrids can be uh, any kind of form you like. Here on the left, obviously, they're more architectural ideas maybe than structural ideas. But just like any truss, if it's triangulated and if it's in three dimensions, uh, it will work as a diagrid. You can find multiple load paths, multiple redundancies for gravity and lateral loads. On the right, uh, something a little bit simpler, a diagrid on a rectangular uh, skyscraper, a project uh, never built. What's interesting here is that the, the engineer and architect are thinking about the way those lateral loads collect as you come down toward the base of the skyscraper. So at the top, um, relatively uh, light gravity loads, relatively light um, collected lateral loading. The wind is greatest at the top, but of course the internal stresses get greater as those collect toward the bottom. And so every few stories there's another uh, set of diagonal braces that gets put onto the facade. And therefore instead of increasing maybe the member size, um, they're increasing actually the number of diagonals to carry the greater and greater collected internal stresses uh, of wind and gravity as, as you come down closer to the, to the ground floor. And here, uh, diagrid frames under construction, you can imagine that um, one of the, the kind of downsides to these is that um, the geometry gets complicated and each one of these connectors has to uh, accept members coming in at 
very, very complicated angles, right? Three-dimensional angles if it's a, if it's a round uh, structure. Easier to do today, which is why we see more and more diagrids, more and more curved uh, structures. Very, very difficult to do before the advent of, uh, uh, of um, digital fabrication and just about impossible to do this on a complex scale before we had the kind of geometrical precision of CAD. Here, uh, a hybrid diagrid combined with uh, what looks to be a very rigid concrete core so that this building uh, has both the efficiency of a diagrid and since there are elevators and stairs and things anyway, um, that concrete core is going to help with the, with the rigidity of the, of the structure. And a couple more examples. Here's a, a typical connection in the shop, and you can imagine how much work it is to get two or three or four inch thick steel cut to the precise dimensions, welded to the required uh, uh, standard of quality, and then think about taking that node and actually putting it on a truck, shipping it out to the site, right? A, a relatively heavy individual piece that allows for a very, very efficient diagrid structure. And you see uh, examples of these here on the left. And we can combine these principles in all kinds of ways. So the, the Hancock Tower uh, in Chicago uh, is really a combination of a, a tube structure, all of the lateral structures on the outside, most of the gravity structures on the outside, it has a core, but that core is actually made of steel. Uh, so you don't get the, the, um, the, the, the benefit of, uh, of stiff concrete. So almost all of the, the wind resistance is being carried by the external structure. It's a tube structure. As you can see, it is also a relatively simple diagrid. The big X's on the exterior of the Hancock are helping to distribute the gravity load between all of the columns but they're also doing all of the work of stiffening the building uh, against, against the wind, putting that wind resistance in the most efficient place on the exterior of the building. The Hancock also tapers exactly like a, a tall building should uh, in, a, in, in, in response to wind. And it has a really unique kind of uh, integration of the structural principle, wider at the base, narrower at the top, with the program itself. The, the bottom half of the structure is uh, offices that require a fairly deep floor plate. The top half of the building is apartments that require a much narrower floor plate. And what SOM did was basically uh, kind of split the difference. So at the very top, you have offices that are maybe on floor plates that are just a little too small for them. And a few floors above that, you have the first apartments that are on floor plates, maybe just a little bit too big for them. Um, but by the time you get up into the apartments or down into the offices, you get relatively efficient uh, floor plates. The very bottom, um, the, the very bottom of the, the building is tuned to a, to a parking garage dimension. So exactly the right size to have a drive aisle on both sides uh, of the core. When you look at the plans, you can see that um, there's steel structures scattered throughout the core and this kind of internal area but most of the structure is concentrated on the exterior. And that is where those giant wind trusses are that brace the building uh, against wind from any uh, compass direction. Here you can see under construction, you maybe get the sense of how those wind braces work even better. Um, and here is one being put into place. By today's standards, that's a relatively simple piece of steel. Um, in 1966, when it was being done, that took an awful lot of drafting, an awful lot of uh, calculation. And of course, you can see that there's a lot of coordination with the cladding uh, and with the internal planning. One disadvantage of diagrids is that many of the windows get restricted views. In some cases, in the Hancock, the apartments that actually have a, a bit of the diagonal uh, tend to go for more money, right? That's part of the, the building's iconography, part of the building's sort of branding. Uh, and very successfully integrated into the way that, that people perceive the building architecturally. So when we get super tall up above the height of the Hancock, up above a thousand or, or, or 1500 feet, um, we have to kind of go through the looking glass again. And we go from building or structural types that we can do in concrete or steel uh, into building types or structural types that really have to be done only in concrete. 
And buttressed cores rely on the stiffness of uh, high strength concrete. So five, six, 7,000 PSI or even more. Um, and they rely on very, very efficient core shapes and very efficient aerodynamic shapes uh, to make the building stand not only against huge gravity loads, but also against wind loads that get really extreme when you get up to the heights that we're talking about. In the case of Burj Khalifa, uh, something like 2,400 feet uh, tall. Here, this is Burj Khalifa compared with Frank Lloyd Wright's scheme for the Mile High Tower uh, in Chicago. And you can see both of them rely on very, very heavy, very, very thick cores in the center uh, of, the, of the floor plate. Skinny towers, 11 to 1 in the case of Burj Khalifa, a mile high would have been 12 to 1. And as you can see, uh, very much tapering uh, toward the top. Also note that they're both tripods. They're both triangular floor plans. And this, if you think about it, the tripod is the most efficient structural shape. Um, it presents the least uh, uh, surface area to uh, crosswinds. And it also spreads out in three, in three directions as simply as possible, right? So three legs, uh, more efficient than four legs. The other trick to Burj Khalifa is if you look, you can see that there's not actually a whole lot of floor area on a typical floor. Um, when we get up to these heights, uh, we can't have kind of giant floor plates like we do in the case of Sears because we need to really restrict the amount of building that's facing the wind. Burj Khalifa is mostly a residential tower. Uh, the top two thirds of it or so are all apartments and therefore need those smaller floor plates that we saw in the Hancock. The only large office floor plates are down here sort of in the lower third uh, of the tower. Also true to say that the accommodation in Burj Khalifa stops fairly short of the actual top and much of this top is basically ornamental, right? Designed to reach the height that would make it the tallest building in the world. You can see here in the core plan, uh, the elevator core, this hexagon here, surrounded by very, very thick uh, shear walls, five, six feet at the base. And then you can see that basically the core is like a, a three-lobed I-beam. So flanges uh, out here uh, and, and a, a basically a web that runs through the core and connects the three lobes of the building. So it's an I-beam that's very, very good in three directions, right? A way of uh, approaching the performance of a hollow tube, but doing it with basically the web and flange principle uh, of, of an I-beam. And the other uh, factor of Burj Khalifa is that it's designed aerodynamically. So the building shape, even though it kind of reminds us maybe of Sears and the way that it steps up, each one of those lobes are, are designed to shed vortices. In other words, to make the building aerodynamic, to prevent those kind of eddies of that turbulence from forming uh, and to, to basically cast them off into the slipstream. And that prevents what we'd be worried about in a very, very skinny building like this, the oscillation back and forth, the harmonic vibration uh, of those eddies forming and then shedding uh, periodically. So SOM uh, did an exhibit a few years ago of all of their kind of super tall high rises. Sears is down here somewhere, I think. Um, here is Burj Khalifa uh, and here is Kingdom Tower, which is under construction now and is supposed to be a whole kilometer tall or 3000 feet. Also using the principle of this buttressed core or making a kind of three lobed I-beam out of the core uh, and a set of shear walls within the building that will provide it with this very, very efficient cantilever shape against the wind uh, in three directions, right? An efficient way uh, of resisting uh, wind from any possible compass direction. And then one final uh, hybrid. Um, here's a building that's uh, gotten a, an awful lot of press recently. This is uh, 111 West 57th Street by Shop that again uses a hybrid or, or combines a couple of high-rise systems to get its very, very skinny 13 to one uh, slenderness ratio. So if you look here, you can see that Shop has clad the whole thing in glass to make it feel like this kind of needle thin, a very, very elegant building. And in fact, there are about six foot shear walls on either side of the structure that rise almost the whole height. And those shear walls are connected uh, to the floor plates by outriggers. 
So basically the whole building is uh, an I-beam of uh, shear walls on the outside and then these trusses that run through the, the central core. You can see too that there are windbreaks, aerodynamic uh, slots in the building that basically let the wind pass through uh, and, and relieve some of, the, some of the wind pressure on it. And then finally a tuned mass damper at the top. Uh, again, that tuned mass damper stays in one place it's usually on a kind of oiled pad and connected to all those shear walls with giant pistons or springs. So the damper stays in place, the building oscillates around it, and the springs take up some of the energy uh, of the building moving around. And then finally, how do you get up to actually um, the 111 West 57th is actually more like 1500 feet. How do you get up there? Well, past the tune mass damper, there's no program space. And this is all basically uh, ornamental at the top, right? A way of achieving the kind of vanity height uh, that the that the um, that the client wanted. So that is a brief overview of what happens when we stretch some of the principles and some of the materials that we've talked about uh, to heights. We've seen how the exponential problems of greater and greater wind load, greater and greater gravity load, get solved with systems that are basically appropriate to various heights or various scales. This will do it for ARC 348. Uh, when we come back in the fall, um, we'll discuss extreme scales at the, in the kind of other orientation. So what happens if instead of building really tall, we want to build really long span? And we'll look at the ways that we take some of the principles that we've looked at already uh, and adapt those to these, again, very exponentially more difficult problems uh, that we run into when instead of going tall, we go long.